like moving large sums of money like within a country it's difficult it's not it's not easy bro yeah, yeah. like that that was that was always uh a, a serious concern right how yeah. were you guys especially after post 911 how were you guys moving these large sums of money from one country to another yeah i mean initially we were using you know just the normal like western union money gram uh but we knew that there were certain limits uh at the time it was i think at four thousand pounds in a month was the maximum any one person could send so we used to pay people to send transactions make transactions for us we used to only let them send a thousand pounds at a time we'd pay them 50 pounds to do it and we'd only use them like two or three times in a month as well as that, uh, the Colombian, I think it was the Colombian, managed to find a, a couple of um, dodgy money transfer agencies mm. who would take cash in the carrier bag and they would transfer it on the back of other people's transfers bit by bit, but they would charge a higher percentage, but it was safe because it was under the counter. Um, and there's various money transfer methods that are, that are black market, you know, uh, you know, there's various ones. <laughs> um, so we were using, it would cost more, but we were using those uh, as much as we could. Chinese, uh, uh, Indian, people like that. Um, but yeah, it was it was a problem. Sometimes we would send people out with cash, a certain amount of cash. Uh, uh, yeah. Like on, like on their person? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Not, and they would just they would just fly over to yeah to, to I mean, Colombia using like high denomination euros was you know the favorite you know three hundred four hundred five hundred euros if we could get them high, any right. high denomination high denomination euro notes because I mean right. you know, if we weren't sending masses out with you know any one trip because each tent that we did was between three and five kilos so it wasn't you know it wasn't it was never much more than thirty grand. So it was easy, easy enough to do it in bits. Um, yeah. So that, that wasn't too bad. Who created that process that y'all were using? I don't, well, the Colombians, I think. They, you know, they, they've got people working in labs 24 7 coming up with new methods and ways every day trying to beat the systems. You know, they, they know what the security is that they've got to get around so that they, they, they try and overcome it any which way they can. Uh, right. So they're sat there all day long, just testing different methods of uh, of impregnation, or, or however they could do it. Um, mm. But yeah, it was a genius method. Um, Did you know how it worked? How do you mean? Like, uh, had I seen it? How 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 did they get like if if it's got all these different chemicals to stop them from being able to smell it, from stop them from being able to uh, test it yeah, so, and all so this stuff. Like, uh, how, do, how, how was get the cocaine extracted from the cloth? All right. So basically, I flew out to Ecuador to bring the first one back because I wanted to make sure it got back. And I also wanted to go out there and see everything, the whole, every stage of the pro, you know, you know, Absolutely. bringing the tent back, going through customs. People are probably thinking, oh, that's crazy. But I didn't want to be sending other people to do something that I, that I hadn't done myself in Absolutely. the future. Absolutely. I so agree I with got, that. I thought well, it was highly unlikely that the police are going to know that I'm, you know, that this is happening because it's the first one. We're just starting. It is ne it's very unusual that the police get the first one. It's normally like the third, fourth, or fifth. Uh, once somebody starts talking or they get, you know, get to hear about things. Mm. So anyway, get, you know, get a flight out to um, Quito, uh, meet the guy. The guy travels down Quito, from Quito is Ecuador. Right? Yeah, Quito in Ecuador. Sorry. So we, mm -hmm. we 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 were we were thinking about either uh, Ecuador or Venezuela as a transit point, mm -hmm. mainly because they don't really produce cocaine themselves. Um, so the think of being that it would be less draw less uh, attention to the attention on that yeah passengers. I mean, these days, I don't think it makes much difference. It's the whole of South America. Not anymore. Yeah, not But anymore. back then, it was a little bit di slightly different. Um, so, you know, went out there on the tourist tip, trying to make out that I was doing the tourist thing. You know, went to C Cotopaxi Volcano, went around, collected loads of uh, brochures about tourist things. Uh, you know, just did all that sort of stuff as a backstory. Got the tent. 
So I, the gun, the gun moves come down from from uh, from from Cali, uh, and the reason he, he picked Ecuador primarily is because he had a network in Quito where they had a safe house, they had somewhere to store the tent, all of this, you know. So they felt safe there. Mm-hmm. So I've arrived. I'm there about a week, done all the tourist bit, and he arrives. I, I bought an Ecuadorian telephone and chip. Uh, sent the number back to London so that when he arrives he can call me on the Ecuadorian rather than going through London you know Mm -hmm. a bit safer so I get a phone call he's you know he's arrived as well he sends a taxi for me taxi takes me all through Quito to make sure I'm not being followed get to the outskirts of Quito get out of the taxi at a garage uh, petrol station and he's waiting there and uh, he didn't speak much English I didn't speak much Spanish so he said, follow me. So I followed him to this like gated compound. So this big metal gate rolls back and we walk in and uh, the gate closes behind us. And I think, well, that's it. I'm in it now. You know? Yeah, that, there's that's no going kind of back normal. <laughs> that's kind of normal in South America. Yeah, yeah. I lived in the Dominican Republic and uh, oh, uh, yeah. we had a big giant gate like that. Yeah, two guys like outside with, uh, you know I mean? with sort of shotguns and shit. Yeah, exactly. So, so, <laughs> mm-hmm. so I've, you know, the gate rolls shut. Go up a set of stairs to the the uh, first floor, in a door. Door shuts behind me, and on the back of the door, there's a there's a gun hanging off the back of the door, like a shotgun or something, you know, long mm-hmm. barrel. Mm-hmm. So I was yeah. like, "Oh, that's not a good sign." <laughs> 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 so I'm thinking, well, I don't know that the cocaine is in this tent. It's the first trip. He could just be giving me a tent with nothing in it. I mean, how right. am I going to know? It's a piece of plastic. I mean, there's no way I can tell. All right. So I try and convey this as best I can with, in my non-existent Spanish uh, spoke a bit of French from school but I mean you know, it's not Spanish is it um, <laughs> and he gets the drift anyway so he goes follow me follow me so I go through into this back room and he gets this tent out and I shit you not this was a 10 man camping tent it was huge it was like as high as my waist and I'm like 5 foot 10 uh, <laughs> like 1 meter 70 so half of that it's about a meter high this tent round it was huge weighed about 40 or 50 kilos in total huge thing so he unrolls it on the floor this 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 um apartment or whatever and he slits open slits like the corner of the ground sheet in it and uh, pulls out this little bit of rubber cuts a little bit of the you know the 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 uh, impregnated rubber that we've got in there and he gives it to me and he says chew it you know you know using sign language and whatnot so I put it in my mouth and I chew it and obviously cocaine makes you go numb, you know, it's an anesthetic. So my mouth goes absolutely numb. And uh, it was like, do you remember the man from Del Monte says yes, the advert, TV advert, man from, from, from yes. the orange juice. And I felt like the man from Del Monte says yes, but I couldn't talk. <laughs> so it was a bit like, you know, <laughs> but could, my mouth was so numb, it, you know, it couldn't really talk. So I knew the cocaine was in there anyway. And it must have been pretty good. Well, it was good. It was excellent, in fact. All right. Um, so we rolled the tent back up, pack it back up, roll it back up. And uh, I go back to the hotel and I wait around a few, I don't know, five, six days for my return flight. And in that time, again, go and buy my family loads of presents, things like ceramic plates that weigh a lot, boxes of cigars, leather jackets, loads of heavy stuff, T-shirts. Totally forget about my luggage allowance. Get to the airport, to the KLM desk. <laughs> you know what's coming. And I put this tent on the conveyor belt, you know, where it weighs you, on the scales where it weighs all your bags and my bags and all the presents. And I'm about, I don't know, 50 or 60 kilos over the allowance. <laughs> like like 100 pounds, oh, 120 I'm, pounds. I'm massively over. And they're like, <laughs> well, you've either got to pay a huge excess. And I mean, it was a lot of money. I, or why don't you get rid of that tent? And I'm like, um, <laughs> I can't get rid of the tent. But here's me in the airport, right? Giving away all these presents to the people that are working in the restaurant, the shops, giving away all these presents, like ceramic, pl- well, yeah, everything, leather jackets. They must have thought it was Christmas. But the people at the desk, the KLM staff, are watching me and they must be thinking, this guy is obviously a fucking drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> So it must have gone ping, ping, ping. All the flags had gone up. So anyway, I managed to somehow get through onto the plane. And I'm like, wow, yeah, that was a miracle. (laughs) So I'm on the plane out of Ecuador. 
And uh, we leave and I'm like, yeah, I'm out. We arrive in Hall- in Holland because I have to change in Holland to to go to England. There was no direct flight, and that the the tent is in the hold. So uh, you know, in transit, the bags are just getting transferred to the other plane. Anyway, we arrive in in Holland at Schiphol Airport, and uh, unbeknownst to me, under the Schengen Agreement, th- whichever country the plane lands in first in Europe is responsible for carrying out the drug search on that plane. And all the passengers. Mm -hmm. So sure enough, all of us are getting filed through a row of Dutch drug agents, police. And I'm at the back of the queue. And uh, one of them, one of these Dutch police, looks down the line, sees me, turns to his mates and says something in Dutch. And they all look at me. And I think, I'm, you know, I'm getting pulled again. I was like, fuck. So I get to the front of the queue and sure enough, they go, we want to talk to you. Come with us. <laughs> so they take me to a holding room and there's about 30 people in there. Three or four of which maybe a European, all the rest of South America. <laughs> uh, so I'm thinking, right, here we go again. So I'm waiting my turn and I'm thinking, I'm, you know, again, I'm not going home. I'm just trying to get it into my head. I'm going to prison. And, uh, my turn comes and they call me into an office and they say, well, what have you been doing? Where have you been? And I, said, and I said, well, look, you know, I've been doing the tourist thing. I've been here. I've been to Cotopaxi Volcano. I've been there, you know, here are the brochures, here are my tickets. This is what I've been doing. And, uh, you know, interviewed me for about 20, 30 minutes. And I was thinking any minute now, they're just going to pull out that big dead man tent and put it on the desk and go, what's this? And I was waiting. What's this posh, Peter? Yeah, yeah. got you? <laughs> what the fuck is this English boy? And um, it didn't happen. So we get to the end of the conversation and they're obviously running out of, out of patience and out of questions. And, uh, and he said to me, uh, he said, oh, uh, again, sorry to have detained you. You're, you're free to go. And I was like, really? Again? So uh, I thought, no, I thought there's no way that they haven't found that tent. They obviously know I'm carrying because they pulled me. Uh, after all that carry-on at the airport in in, in Quito, um, you know, they must know that I'm carrying drugs. So I start thinking, perhaps they've spoken to the police in Britain and they got, they've decided for some reason, whatever it is, that they're going to arrest me on my return to England so they can maybe get all of us or, you know, or, or whatever. Who knows how they think? So mm. that's what's in my head. So I get on the plane and it's only a short flight from from Schiphol to, it was to Stansted, just north of London. Mm-hmm. 45 minutes, the plane hardly takes off. It's like, psh. <laughs> right. So it's gone up for a second and as soon as it's up, it's coming down and we land and I get to the luggage carousel and there's the tent going round and round and round and I'm watching it and I'm looking around the, the room and I'm thinking, you know, I'm just trying to see if there's any police or anyone suspicious and I think, you know, it's shall I, shall I, shall I? And I think, oh, fuck it. And I take, grab it and I walk, and I walk straight through customs and I'm out. And suddenly <laughs> I'm, I'm out and I'm, you know, I'm out of the airport. And I hadn't told anyone, not even my, the Colombian or the Chilean, that I was coming back on this day. I thought, no one needs to know. The, the, you know, in that way, the only person that can fuck this up is me. So That's if, right. Yeah. So if no one knows and only I know, then, you know. No one knows, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm now out of the airport and that adrenaline rush was even bigger than, you know, anything from earlier. Right. So I, I phone up the, the Colombian uh, from a payphone and they said, where are you? And I said, I'm back. And they said, back where? And I said, I'm back in England. And they were like, what? Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, but I got stopped. And uh, they were like, oh. And I said, yeah, but don't worry, I've got it. <laughs> And uh, so to me, that just showed me how good our system was. You know, I'd been stopped, well, not stopped, but I'd got through Dutch, uh, sorry, I've got, I'd got through Ecuadorian customs. I'd got through Dutch customs and been stopped and questioned. And I'd now got it through English customs as well. So I'd gone through three sets and I was like, wow, you know, we are onto a winner here. This is because there weren't many people doing this method at this point. This was fairly new at the time. 
What, around what year was this? This is like 2003. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I was like, wow, this is, you know, if as long as we do this right and uh, we keep this on the lowdown and we only let the minimum of people know what we're doing, we only sell to a handful of people because we don't need, you know, the less people know, the better what we're doing. Of course. So, yeah, it, uh, take it. So I, yeah, we, so I take the tent down to London. They've arranged an apartment. Uh, I can't remember where, but, uh, you know, a makeshift laboratory. So, um, uh, they've got all the chemicals ready. They've got a friend of theirs, another Colombian who's worked in the, in the labs in, in Colombia, in the, in the big labs, you know, making the Coke to come and help with the extraction process. Mm -hmm. So this is, so the extraction process is basically, um, once we got the tent back, we would have to strip out the, 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 uh, sheets of, uh, latex or rubber with cocaine impregnated into it. Mm -hmm which were, like I said, were, were made really thin because the Coke's only on the surface. So we would then have to try and maximize the surface area. So we'd strip out these panels, we'd cut them up with scissors as small as possible to maximize the surface area. Then we soak that in methanol, which is like pure alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to answer your question, we would then filter that solution. So, so after about 24 hours, you would see the color of the methanol change from being clear to like the color of gas gasoline. Mm -hmm. So at that point you would know that the cocaine is, has come back out into solution. So we would then, uh, filter that solution through activated carbon and, and filter papers in order to take out any impurities such as chemicals that we put in that shouldn't be there, colorants, anything, any smells. So that would filter out a lot of that. We would then add a bit of acetone, uh, which is not, mm -hmm. which cleans it up further. Um, and it all gets a little bit complicated, but we were impregnating cocaine base, not cocaine hydrochloride. Mm. And the reason not, for not, not the powder that you could actually consume, well, but no, 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 the no, basis no, no. of that. No, no, because co cocaine base is similar to crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. It's at that Bastard. stage. Yeah, basic. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that we were doing that is because if, when it came to the extraction process, if we used cocaine hydrochloride, we'd lose about between 20 and 30% mm -hmm. in volume. Whereas if it was cocaine base, we'd only lose between 10 and 15. So mm -hmm. a lot less loss <laughs> in volume. Uh, so we used to use base and it was stronger as well. Um, so yeah, so once we've got it into this solution, we filled it, put a little bit of acetone in, uh, and a little bit of hydrochloric acid, obviously to, so, you know, so it's, uh, to break the membrane down in your nose. So it gets into your system. We would then boil that down in a, in a nonstick wok, you know, for doing your stir fries on an electric hob with a powerful extractor fan over the top. Cause obviously there's a lot of fumes coming off of this and it's highly explosive. Right. So evaporating all this, all this alcohol off and it would get pretty heady in there, you know, with the mix. <laughs> mm. Hell yeah. I bet, yeah. I bet everybody was high. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're all getting high as hell and drunk and weird, like bleh, really weird buzz. <laughs> um, and you'd start to see that the, uh, liquid just would start to congeal, uh, start to thicken up. Mm -hmm. And at this point we would like turn the heat right down so as not to burn it. And, uh, you'd see it start to form into like powder and, uh, you know, and then turn, turn it down even further and, and it would just form back up into powder. That's crazy. So it, we would then have powdered cocaine, not cocaine, like in flake, you know, like you see, right. you know, not because that's a bit of a longer process and we didn't need to do that because the people that we were selling it to were quite happy to buy it either in the powder form, like we were getting it to, or we would then repress it using a hydraulic, uh, press with a mm -hmm. box. Um, so it was in a block form, but not right. flaky. Right. Um, so once we got it into the powder, we would then, we had our friend build a box out of hardwood and bolts and we had two steel compressed plates top and bottom. So we then put some cheesecloth in there or muslin 
and mm. put about, about five layers of coke in that to the kilo. But between each layer, we spray a bit of acetone in there to get it to bind up nicely and for the smell. Oh, no, sorry. We would quite have to cut, cut this before we did the repress. We'd, uh, we'd put normally about 60% cocaine, 40% cut, depending on how it, uh, how it washed back into crack and also how strong that mix was. Because you know, when you brought it back, um, you would it would be like what ninety six, ninety seven percent, right? 90, yeah, so in yeah, the high, throw, in the high throw, 90s, throw, 90s, pure. Yeah, throw that cut on it. Yeah. So, so, so the five keys would turn into like eight keys, seven, seven and a half, seven, seven mm-hmm. something like that. Okay. Um, yeah. So having cut it, we would then put it through coffee grinders to make make sure the the cut was all even, so it was evenly mixed. It used to take a while to do all this, like oh, yeah. two, three days sitting in that lab. And it was a bit nervy then, you know, loads of oh, cocaine yeah. everywhere. You know, it's all up in the atmosphere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. 